Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, keynote session this afternoon. We are going to examine the role of the European Union in global health. Very exciting. And we have a more than competent panel to do this. May I introduce me first, maybe? My name is Clemens Martin Auer, and I'm doing this moderation here in my capacity as president of the European Health Forum, which, by the way, was also the host of the European Health Union Initiative. In my professional life, I'm the special envoy for health of the Austrian government. And uh, in that capacity, I am also one of the vice chairs of the executive board of WHO. Um, let me introduce this really uh, highly competent uh, panel to you. We have uh, the Madam Commissioner among us, Stella Kyriakides, European Commissioner for Health and Food Safety. We have uh, Hans Kluge here, the Regional Director of WHO Euro, a high level World Health Organization representative. We have uh, Minister Janis Pukla here, the Minister of Health of the Republic of Slovenia in his capacity as uh, Presidency of the European Council. And we have here on the podium, <clears throat> um, in terms of gender balancing here very nicely, uh, Stephanie Sedon, the ambassador for global health, the minister for Europe <clears throat> and foreign affairs in the, of the Republic of France, and Ruxanda Draghi-Aki, the global head of Johnson & Johnson Global Public Health R&D, and Johnson and Janssen R&D in, <clears throat> in the US. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, in initiatives to create a European health union entail an important political opportunity to strengthen the global health role of the European Union. And by the way, the, the Euro European Union already is the biggest contributor to global health. Statistically, we don't see it sometimes because we are not counting them together, the EU27 and the contribution by the European Commission. But if you do that, then you clearly see that the number one contributor when it comes to global health initiatives is the European uh, Union. I am also convinced that the European Union's internal legal and political capacity of health immediately interacts with its global uh, goals in global health. A stronger global health role for the EU will bring geopolitical advantages, of course, but will also benefit the global community as well as EU member states internally. And it affects many areas of EU policy, including development policies, of course, foreign policies, and setting safety standards, very important, safety standards that impact global health in areas such as food safety, chemical safety, environmental policies, and more recently, digital health. But, and I think we should concentrate this also in this panel here, it will depend all on the political leadership and the political decisions by the 27 governments of the 27 member states and uh, how, you know, how actively we all as a union play, will play a role in global health. Uh, I think what the pandemic crisis showed us that we don't have an excuse and go, can go back to normal. That's, I think, not a choice we have. So we have to be more multilateral organ oriented. And you know, the European Health Forum this year's conference had a catchy title. It was Rise Like a Phoenix, you know, a new era for multilateralism. And I think that what our panel is also about. How will we proceed here? We will first have a short keynote by Madam Commissioner. Thank you very much. And then we will have a discussion among our panelists. It uh, depends on. How, how excited we are, two or three rounds here. And please, the audience here in the room and also uh, online in the chat box is uh, more than uh, welcome to contribute uh, in the discussions. So let me hand over to Madam Commissioner. Thank you to having you here. And um, uh, maybe you can lay out the, the vision of the European Commission when it comes to the role of the European Union in global health. And we do know that you have to leave the panel right after your keynote. So, but, uh, but please go ahead and uh, give, you a, give you an enlightened vision to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, 
Clemens, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you all, distinguished guests, uh, uh, Minister, uh, Dr. Kluger. Uh, Clemens, thank you for all the work that you're doing in the area of global health, which I think uh, you touched on uh, in your introductory remarks as being uh, so very important to us all. Uh, of course, like any virus, um, COVID-19 has highlighted, I would say, the fault lines within our societies, but also in our health systems. And what we have seen is that it has amplified uh, the inequalities. We have seen how vulnerable groups have been further affected. And we have, uh, it has revealed the tendency to underfinance and underprioritize health. Um, it is, um, has shown us what in the areas that we need to really work on and, and to improve. And since day one of this pandemic, I have always said, uh, and it's been absolutely clear to me, that we need to have collaboration and solidarity as the only way towards healthy, uh, more equal, and even I would say uh, more resilient societies. Uh, in practice, this means that the healthcare cannot be the responsibility of the health sector alone. Uh, its success depends, as exactly you have already said, on multi-level and multi-sectoral cooperation. And we need to understand that by investing today in the area of health, we are really saving uh, trillions uh, tomorrow. And this applies to the current crisis, but of course also to the day after COVID-19. Any solution must include the most vulnerable members of our society because they are, I would say, the benchmark, the baseline against which we need to measure success. So I'm really delighted to be able to join you again this year in the World Health Summit, um, where there are leaders from th across the world of science, of politics, of the private sector, of civil society, because this is exactly what we need, this level of inclusivity uh, to build long and sustainable progress. As a European Union, we are determined to do our part. We are taking decisive and coordinated action um, in the area of, the, of dealing with this pandemic. We are building a strong European health union in which all EU countries are going to be better prepared and are able to respond together in health crisis and where innovative medical supplies are both accessible and affordable. Uh, in this way, we are going to better ensure to protect the health of our citizens, to give the EU and its member states the tools that they need to prevent, because I think prevention is a huge, hugely important term we need to use, and also address future pandemics and to strengthen the resilience of Europe's health systems. The European Health Union is a very broad, I would say, uh, canopy. It's going to mobilize all our resources to strengthen our fight against cancer, improve access to pharmaceuticals for all the citizens. It is going to focus in the, in the immediate term, in the short term, on our preparedness and response by building a stronger EU health security framework, uh, by having stronger mandates for ECDC and EMA, and of course, by the new Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA. HERA, which we have uh, often spoken about, its core mission is to strengthen the EU health security coordination and to allow us to potentially look at identification of potential health emergencies and be ready to react very quick, quickly when they occur. And it will also have a very strong uh, role in global, in global surveillance uh, and cooperation. So for us, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, global solidarity really offers the only way uh, to come to permanently exit from this pandemic. And when I speak about um, uh, global inequity, uh, I, when it comes to vaccination, it is simply unacceptable. And I say this as a European Commissioner for Health and Food Safety, uh, and as a global citizen, that we cannot achieve global equity. We need to speed up global vaccination. It is an absolute priority. We're determined to continue doing our part in this. Uh, the EU re recently reached an important milestone in the delivery of vaccines. We have exported over 1 billion doses worldwide over the past 10 months. And vaccines which are produced in the EU have been exported to over 150 countries uh, worldwide. 
Uh, in fact, every second uh, dose of what is uh, produced in the EU is exported. And at the same time, the EU and its member states uh, as Team Europe have mobilized over 46 billion euro for partners countries efforts to fight COVID-19 and particularly low and middle income countries. As you know, we helped set up the ACT Accelerator and we're uh, spearheading the global vaccine rollout uh, through COVAX with over 3 billion euro support. So we're going to be continuing to, to support this vital initiative, but I would say that all of us know that we need to do more. And in the coming months, Team Europe will be donating a further 500 million doses to the most vulnerable countries. And we're calling upon all nations across the world to, uh, to, to vaccinate uh, and to make meaningful contribution for vaccine readiness. The pandemic has also highlighted structural problems and um, the wide discrepancies in between medical manufacturing capabilities around the world. For example, just for some numbers, Africa still imports 99% of its vaccines and 94% of its medicines. And earlier this year, the EU announced a 1 billion uh, euro initiative to enhance local medical manufacturing in Africa. And this was a direct call to a direct uh, reaction to uh, a call by African leaders to boost local pharmaceutical production. So we need to do a great deal more working together to contribute um, to our overall goal of supporting resilient health systems across the world. We will continue as an EU to live up to our global uh, and moral responsibilities and working towards building this global health architecture. We will not stop supporting WHO's vital uh, leadership role and advancing the WHO reform process. We have worked with WHO from day one of this, of, of this pandemic. We will continue to lead the movement for an international treaty of pandemic preparedness and response because both of these uh, allow us to be better prepared for the future. But after two years, almost now two years of living with COVID, we need to look at the better, bigger picture. We need to see how we can cooperate, how we can interact with the world uh, around us. We're dealing with a respiratory virus on a planet that is already in many ways struggling to breathe. To breathe. And uh, it's important that we address issues such as AMR uh, and through uh, the farm to fork strategy, which is another key piece of, of, of this puzzle and part of my portfolio, we're looking to build healthy, uh, fairer and environmentally friendly food systems. And this is part of the Green Deal. So all these elements, and I will end here, um, underline what I tried to touch upon and share with you from the beginning. And that I believe in, in really, it's, it's part and parcel, I think, of, of, of my, my beliefs, how we need to work. We need to work in partnership. We need to work together. We need to work in solidarity because only this way we will be able to build equal and more resilient societies. And this crisis in so many ways has been a wake up call uh, across the world. Uh, our health, the health of our planet uh, need to come first, uh, but not just for now, not while we're in the crisis. I think that we cannot go back to where we were two years ago. We can only look forward. And I really look uh, towards working closely with every single one of you uh, so that we can build a stronger uh, planet, uh, a more resilient, more resilient health systems, and of course, uh, a more resilient uh, EU in the area of health. Thank you. Thank you, Stella, for your remarks, and uh, I'm I'm very happy to to echo some lines you know you're making here. You know, I think one of the biggest uh, and important policy frameworks in our minds is that investment in health is other savings for the future. That's a very good line. Thank you for this. I think we should write it very, very in bold letters on each and every political intervention. And that you already had took, that you took the first steps in, in lessons learned, you know, strengthening ECDC, EMA, HERA, et cetera, et cetera. And thank you also for strength, uh, mentioning the EU vaccines policy, which is sometimes not is not getting the right headlines you know because i think it's a very very important and very successful part of the 
of the of the of the global solidarity the EU is exercising. But Stella, please go on. I just want before leaving because I think thank you, first of all thank you thank you Clemens for all the work that I know you've played part in this. Sometimes we take it for granted, and you're absolutely right. But the EU vaccine strategy has shown what solidarity can do. Uh, we are now uh, working with the 27 mm. member states now for. Uh, and we have secured vaccines in every corner of the European Union in, in bigger and smaller countries. And I dread to think what would have happened if we hadn't uh, moved this way. And we should not take things for granted. We need to also speak about the, the good things that we have done, the successes of, we, of, of what we have done, but work to make this, this global and move forward. And sometimes in the area of prevention, uh, we tend to oversee this in health policy. And you cannot see the results immediately, but it would always, must always be in our minds that this is for the future, the way we need to go in so many areas. So thank you so much for highlighting it and all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. And we know that you have a busy schedule. So thank you for sharing your time with us and uh, wish you a wonderful afternoon in Brussels. You're obviously in your office, so you are. Yes, I'll stay for a bit more to listen to the next speakers, if I okay. may, and then I will polite, quietly come out. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, let's go on, and, and uh, I would like to, to go next uh, to, to the Minister of, Slo uh, the Minister of Health in uh, the Republic of Slovenia, Janis. Uh, Slovenia has taken up the topic of global health in its current presidency of the Council of, of the European Union. What are the main recommendations in it from the Slovenian perspective to put the European Union in the driver's seat when it comes to global health? And uh, what is the concrete and operational policies you are working on? Please, ministers, welcome among, among us here. And uh, I think you are sitting in your office in beautiful Ljubljana. We can't hear you. Yeah. Now we hear each other. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Clements. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this important uh, panel discussion. Indeed, uh, as you mentioned, uh, one of our priorities is strengthening the role of European Union in global health. Uh, Slovenia is not uh, the first uh, presidency to address this challenge. We have decided to continue a successful initiative of several initiative presidencies, an initiative that has been started by Finland already before the pandemic. The pandemic has further highlighted the need to better coordinate in global health. One of key challenges during the past months was ensuring global equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, like earlier mentioned uh, uh, commissioner. Uh, along with a, a fair uh, distribution of vaccines, the continuous focus should be on strengthening health systems around the world to ensure health threats preparedness, as well as universal health coverage. And this is one of uh, the key recommendations of our presidency also. We need to carry on uh, with efficient uh, health promotion and disease prevention as well as the detection and appropriate timely treatment of communicable and non-communicable disease, diseases globally. Investing in strong, resilient and uh, inclusive national health systems has been indicated as crucial also by the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development. Uh, at uh, EU level, there are already several existing mechanisms and instruments to support the strengthening of health systems beyond EU and enhancing global health security. Still, more holistic, uh, inclusive and better coordinated action would be needed to size all the opportunities to strengthen health systems globally. By closer cooperation, uh, coordination and uh, active involvement of relevant stakeholders, including civil society and non-governmental organizations, we could reach our goals faster. There is also uh, a lot of potential in creating partnerships and networks of countries and relevant stakeholders. They could provide support to strengthen uh, health systems globally in terms of preparedness, 
capacity building, uh, health promotion, health research and development as well as digital health globally. And this is from Slovenia for the first time. Thank you, Clemens. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister, for your, uh, for your um, uh, clear vision here. Um, and may I ask, um, before I go to the, to the two ladies here on the panel, may I go to Hans, Hans Kluge, the Regional Director of WHO, and I think, uh, Hans, you, you made a big step, uh, you know, your first step when it comes to lessons learned after this pandemic crisis, or we are still in the pandemic crisis, and you convened the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, and chaired by no one less than Professor Mario Monti. And the Commission has published a groundbreaking report, I would like to say, uh, pointing to the wider dimensions that need to be considered. Hans, what are your next steps and what are, you ex what, are, what are your expectations when it comes to your vision of a new so social contract for healthy and the resilient societies in Europe but around, uh, around the world? And welcome, Hans, to be with us here. Thank you so much, uh, dear Clemens. And I know that the Commissioner will have to move on. So before I answer the question, I wanted to express my appreciation to Commissioner Kriakidis for indeed the tremendous solidarity and support, not only to, let's say, my pan-European region, but globally, and walking the talk that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And we saw it when we were together in Ljubljana. And thank you, Minister Pokolukar, for having invited there also the ministers of health of the Western Balkan, because we launched the Western Balkan roadmap there. So I think that's really walking the talk and, and a great feeling. Now, on your question, dear Clemens, maybe a short word. Why did I put together this independent commission? I felt somehow that we failed a bit after the financial crisis to convince the Minister of Finance and the, the heads of state that health is to be at the center of our society. And this was a second chance. So that's why indeed I asked Professor Mario Monti to chair this as a previous prime minister and minister of finance to chair this high-level independent commission underpinned by a scientific advisory board where you, dear Clemens, thank you, also is, uh, is taking part. And the innovation is it's pan-European, but with a global perspective, and that it has mainly non-health commissioners. So we became a little bit more smart. And as Professor Monti is telling, what's happening now is the health sector taking the other sectors hostage because of the underinvestment in the health systems. The next steps is that the commission has finished its uh, report, presented it to the region committee in September, and now there is a working group of member states looking at the feasibility and how to operationalize the recommendations. Coming to the social contract, I would say that the vision on health and well-being for our pan-European region, the EPW, European Programme of Work, which was endorsed last year, in fact, is a social contract. Because the political premise is, what do the citizens legitimately expect from their health authorities? And let me give one example, the Oslo Medicines Initiative. The citizens expect from their government that they have access to affordable, life-saving, novel medicines. And this Oslo Medicines Initiative aims exactly at a new social contract between public sector, private sector, involving also the so-called non-state actors to ensure a sustainable equal supply to affordable medicines, which next year, hopefully, we can present together with different sectors mid-June at the high-level conference in Oslo. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, for, for highlighting, highlighting here very, very important um, issues. And, uh, and that maybe it's a, a very good choice that we move on to the industry perspective on that, because I think there has been a lot of buzz around the launch of HERA by the European Commission, um, I think rightly so. But from an industry perspective, what are your expectations of this new authority? And could this also be a basis for enhanced cooperation and collaboration when it comes to R&D and securing supply chains. I think that was one of the main topics um, uh, here when it comes to the supply for the citizens of Europe, but 
<laughs> probably also for the global in the global spec. So, um, um, Ruxandra, you are representing the industry on this panel. Yes, thank you, Clemens. And uh, you started the conference, the panel, by saying that we are going to go back to normal. Uh, and I think that we are not going back to normal. Is, we are not going back to normal. We are building a new normal. Exactly. Uh, and as Commissioner Kiriakidis was mentioning, um, I think that in the global COVID-19 response, we have seen a really unprecedented degree of collaboration among authorities, uh, resulting in really a smoother, swifter authorization and approval processes uh, for innovative products. And in particular, in Europe, we have seen this closer EU collaboration uh, in pandemic preparedness, a stronger European uh, CDC, accelerated EMA uh, assessments for treatments and vaccines, which we believe will really help Europe's resilience uh, to public health threats. Unfortunately, this is not uniform. We have seen here and there around the globe that the requirements for country-specific regulatory review and licensure are often different requirements for dossiers, for packaging, for labeling, uh, adding really unnecessary complexity and costs uh, when time is of the essence to accelerate the access uh, to affordable life-saving products. So I think that we should take all those lessons learned and we would welcome a standing group of regulatory experts, for instance, to develop streamlined and pre-negotiated requirements for data submission, uh, to create common international standards for product packaging and labeling in pandemic time, and really strengthen mechanisms for ongoing mechanisms between the different stakeholders as they have been put in place now um, that will really ensure that the safe products uh, uh, will, will arrive the sooner uh, the possible uh, to those that need them the most. And then uh, really from that, we applaud the a commission that has seen sees this opportunity uh, to table multiple proposal that will surely strengthen EU's resilience to global health uh, uh, threats, and particularly the recent launch of HERA. Uh, offers a chance to strengthen uh, the union's pandemic preparedness uh, as well as collaboration between public and private uh, sector. Uh, and HERA could bring forward very much needed innovation in the area of preparedness, uh, em uh, emergency response, uh, together with appropriate stakeholders, including the industry. We would really welcome clarity uh, around the peacetime research uh, and also measures uh, that uh, would allow a much more structured, closer dialogue uh, with the industry uh, as we go along. And last but not least, because we are in global public health and this is uh, in the, the blood, in the making of JNJ, I think that this uh, pandemic also reminded us that we cannot forget the other diseases. Um, just uh, last week, the WHO report on TB have been released and we have seen uh, a diminished number uh, of diagnoses and the initiation of treatments. Very similar uh, work put forward by the Global Fund have seen that while uh, there is treatment, the newly diagnosed cases have decreased by 22%. So what I would say is that we really need to respond to pandemics, but we cannot forget the other diseases. A disease does not wait for the other to end. Thank you, Ruxandra. Um, Stephanie, you are the future because uh, you, you are the, uh, France will follow the footsteps of the Slovenian uh, presidency and you in, will inherit quite a bit of uh, big policy dossiers on the global sector, pandemic treaty and uh, many, many other things which will come up in, under your presidency. So what is your take on all this? Well, thank you very much. And I can build up on what Commissioner Kirikidis said, that we must collectively 
build a preference for the future um, now that we have seen that indeed a swift response to the emergency crisis uh, was a necessity and was also possible. Um, so indeed, France will uh, follow up in uh, Slovenia's uh, footsteps as, for, as from January uh, next year. And um, what well, maybe the first thing I, I should say is that we will, our task will be made easier by the fact that we will keep building on what has been already started under uh, Slovenian's presidency and the previous presidencies. And I remember a year ago, uh, the WHS uh, focused on the orientations which were uh, being proposed by the um, German uh, presidency. So. There is a continuity that we will, of course, uh, that France will continue to, to hold up. I guess um, amongst the proposed orientations, well, first of all, the, the months to come will remain an opportunity to uh, indeed, as uh, Commissioner Kirikidis said, to show, to keep showing solidarity and relevance in the in the response, and um, as has been said, there's been a contribution of over uh, 40 billion uh, euros to the to the crisis. Uh, there's been a swift Team Europe uh, response, which uh, indeed contributed, I think, to to this uh, collective, efficient, uh, um, well, best case scenario, let's say, in the face of the of the crisis. But looking on to the future, which is your question, um, what will be interesting is to keep building on existing institutions, the ECDC, the uh, EMA, the European Medicines Agency, and the new uh, HERA agency, which uh, of course will have both this focus on research development and uh, as well as uh, emergency response when when uh, a crisis is uh, is in the making so uh, with these three pillars and work on these three pillars the idea is to really rebuild or improve um, the surveillance and the, secu the health security uh, system and do so with a global outlook and with a view to cooperating uh, openly and uh, in a propositional uh, way with WHO, uh, starting obviously with the work done uh, at regional uh, level and to um, propose a, a, a model of indeed uh, uh, integrated or more integrated uh, cooperation. So these would be the uh, the orientations. Um, I think there's an, an opportunity for, for Europe to, and I will stop here, but I'm, I'd, I'd be glad to pick this up maybe later in the conversation, to offer perhaps more than it has done until now, a, a European vision of global health at um, multilateral level, there is there are bases for Europe to actually have a narrative on health based on solidarity, as was said. We have a tradition in our countries with our different histories of health being a collective common good uh, with an attention to the most vulnerable, as the commissioner reminded us of, with um, also a specific model of cooperation with um, a place which is the right place for the private sector. And um, I think it's, it's, there is an opportunity to um, propose something at international level, uh, which um, derives from this very specific narrative that Europe is able to offer at international level. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephanie. I would like to invite also our audience here in the hall and uh, on, on, on Zoom, on the chat box to, to participate in our debate and discussions here. So maybe I also can ask you for some remarks. And um, I do see one hand raised here. Yes, please go ahead. And uh, um, uh, maybe you can introduce you, who you are and uh, what sure. you're and, uh, we, and direct a question to you, to, the, to our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Nina Jamal from Four Paws International, it's an animal welfare organization. Thank you for the leadership uh, as European Council, European Commission, uh, the upcoming presidency, the current presidency. You've shown us what the pathway needs to look like. And one thing that we're missing as an animal welfare movement is the focus on prevention. 
it's cheaper if we tackle the root causes, if we make sure that factory farming is phased out, if we make sure that wildlife trade is phased out, it, it's good for everyone. And I was wondering whether it's going to be part of the agenda moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there maybe another question? Um, not in the moment, and I don't see anything in my my little uh, uh, not nothing on the chat box here. So, who wants to 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 respond to that? And 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 I think there are many initiatives going coming up. Maybe Hans, you are because you have uh, probably a very good oversight what's coming on under the global perspective when it comes to WHO. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Indeed, I am very uh, appreciative that this point comes up because this is the first key recommendation of what we call now the Monty Report, a new strategy for health and sustainable development, drawing light from the pandemic. It is operationalized the concept of one health mm. at all levels, which exactly speaks to the point of prevention. And it calls upon governments to establish structures, incentives, and a supportive environment to develop coherent cross-government One Health strategies. And from a pan-European level, we, a couple of months ago already, made the agreement with my counterparts of FAO, of the World Organization on Animal Health, and also now of UNEP. Because, great point, we know that 70% of the future cross-border health threats are going to be zoonotic. And the reason why we're in the problems now is indeed because of the issues at the interfaces between human, animal, plants, environment, health, and taking this forward. I just came from a duty travel from Turkmenistan in Ashgabat, and there Central Asia already is going to take a blunt move by establishing a regional center close to the RLC on One Health. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hans. And I do know that the European Union, as a led by the Netherlands, put that on the agenda, actually, of the World Health Assembly when it comes to animal uh, life, uh, what is the wildlife markets, etc. Do you have a, a notion on that? or? <clears throat> well, yes, of course. I yeah. mean, you were talking earlier about the future yes. and um, the taking into account the One Health dimension is absolutely key uh, if you were if we want to to move forward in the right way and indeed prepare the uh, the for the reinforced um, preparedness uh, in in the best possible way so i want to thank uh, hans kluger for having put this on the table it is an absolutely crucial dimension france was with germany and others um instrumental in proposing the high level expert panel yes. for one health with, uh, uh, which is a council of um, renowned, world-renowned scientists in all these areas, animal, human, environmental health, um, who will, together with the main um, United Nations organizations, including WHO, um, make proposals to decision makers, as well as to the world's public opinion, um, analysis and recommendations on the way forward uh, regarding One Health, which is, by the way, one of the um, one of the dimensions which a future treaty could exactly. better take into account. But I'll I'll leave it here. Roxana, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, and I would like to say that this element is going to become, um, and we have seen it now with the coronavirus, but it is essential uh, because this is part of the preparedness. You need to uh, actually gear your research in the areas which will become the most important uh, in order to prevent or mitigate a possible pandemic or epidemic. And all it starts with the surveillance and surveillance of the animal reservoirs, not only of what is happening in our fellow human beings. So uh, we have seen that up to now, we had those surveillance efforts, but they were each in their own area, uh, not talking too much to each other. But we do believe that in order to really be prepared for the next pandemic, we have to have an integrated view uh, as far as, you know, and this element of One Health and really take all the necessary steps to integrate it 
in the research and development that we are going to put forward in the next decades. Thank you. Um, let's move on in our discussion here a little bit and, and uh, let's reflect. You know, one of the big success stories, you know, we, are, we, we, are, we love to tell now, in the, with, at least within the European Union, is, uh, is the COVAX vaccine rollout, you know, because I think that was a fine example, for, at least for, within the European Union, for, for and, and a fine success story when we collaborate and cooperate uh, in, in the rightly way. Um, but before we get too full of ourselves, because this was a true success story, I would like to draw the attention to uh, and go back to Hans, because Hans is representing truly not only the European Union in the Euro region, and uh, uh, the, the two of us, we do know that uh, many, many other countries in your region, also in our our shared uh, WHO Euro region uh, don't share that assessment that we were so successful in Europe when it comes to uh, um, uh, COVID vaccines and the, the production and the sharing. So what is your take when you look at uh, the Central Asian republics and, and the other regions, uh, uh, other countries in, in our region? What, what do they expect when it comes to this global solidarity, for example, not only, but for example, uh, the vaccines? Yes, first and foremost, my very sincere appreciation, uh, dear Clemens, that Gastein has consistently been looking also beyond the EU, right, because we're living in a broader European region. And I feel in, uh, even more legitimate to speak about this because I just finished a three-week uninterrupted intense duty travel from Ashgabat, where I spoke to the president, to Ljubljana, where Dr. Poklukar kindly invited me to the EU Minister of Health meeting, then to Minsk in Belarus, where was the meeting of the CIS Ministers of Health, and then to Portugal. So a number of points are clear indeed that issues are the same, but the inequity is really huge. And we see increasing geopolitical tensions, and that's not good. To give one example, whether in, we discussed in fact both in Ljubljana and in Minsk the issue of the COVID certificate, right? That people say yes, there is solidarity, but this imposes some restrictions on travel. There is a high appreciation for the solidarity by the European Commission because it's a fact that uh, vaccine donations have been scaling up. And to the audience, I would like to acknowledge that I had. Uh, um, Dr. Clemens Ower had agreed to be my special envoy on the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. And we have a great collaboration with the commissioners Stella Kiriakidis and uh, Ms. Sandra Galina. We have now a good idea. What is a surplus in the EU countries? And what are the needs in the non-EU countries? So the WHO region for office is a kind of a, let's say, a matchmaking platform. And I think what they expect is indeed to further have this increase in uh, solidarity. And the common speech is that health goes beyond politics. I think that was very clear when I spoke to President of Turkmenistan or to Alexander Grigorovich Lukashenko in Minsk, that health nowadays is really a very powerful tool for health diplomacy, because what every person leading the country agrees is that health goes beyond politics. We need health of prisoners health of migrants, health of the vulnerable groups. So maybe I will leave it as a, a first uh, round uh, over here, Dirk Lemmens. Thank you, Hans. So I might have to challenge uh, Mr. Pokluklar on this a little bit more, because some EU member states have been accused of concentrating foremostly on their national situation and hoarding vaccines. Um, how, so how, how can we assure more solidarity between member states? Uh, at when, when you, and, and we heard Hans, you know, it's not the solidarity between the EU member states, but the member states of the WHO Euro region alone. And I will uh, address the same question then when we look at the, to the Global South to, to Stephanie, because I think the France is always very vocal about that. But, but um, Minister, uh, what, is, what is your power as presidency that we're making more progress when it comes to vaccine sharing in our own WHO Euro region? Uh, thank you for these important questions. 
Uh, countries uh, initially reacted to protect their own nations, that's normally. Uh, but very soon it became clear that multilateral solutions can benefit us all. So the, uh, the perfect example is a joint procurement scheme to deliver vaccines, which indeed simplified negotiation processes. It was much more efficient compared to running individual purchases. It was beneficial for all member states regarding speed, then supply and of course costs of operation. I believe that the pandemic has improved our understanding of the real value of common response at the EU level. Uh, from a global perspective, we have seen a lot of commitment by EU and its member states to donate their vaccines or financially support purchases through COVAX or bilaterally. In practice, however, we have seen that donation of vaccines is still slower as it uh, could be. And uh, this could be related to uncertainties of the third bo uh, booster doses or about uh, administrative or logistic and uh, procedural challenges. Uh, better understanding of those reasons will uh, be instrumental also for further health crisis. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, building trust and good coordination mechanisms internally will also empower us in EU to be more pro proactive in materializing solidarity globally. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, Stephanie, we, uh, our, the title of our panel is EU and Global Health. So I think, uh, I think it's okay for me to direct this question to you because there's been a lot of discussion around uh, EU-African relations uh, uh, and as, as being hampered by an, outdated, by an outdated development and charity model. And I think your president of um, uh, Macron recently promised more vaccines for the global south. Um, what do you see as the way forward? What is your view on whether pandemic vaccines should be always be a global public good? And uh, how do you define this complex term of a global public good when it comes, for example, to vaccines or other medicines and, and medical devices? Well, thank you. Um, there are many questions in your, in your question. But uh, maybe to, to start with the, the last one, the global public good. Well, I mean, France doesn't pretend to, to invent a new definition. Regarding health, it is definitely linked to equitable access. And as soon as April 2020, when, well, um, multilateral action came together with a very strong European push, even then, uh, President Macron when the ACTE, the Access to COVID Tool Accelerator was created, it was insistent that this be around the notion of equitable access to whatever innovations would be necessary to fight COVID. And at the time, uh, everyone was hoping, nobody was really uh, imagining that we would get so fast uh, to a vaccine, which was uh, obviously uh, an extremely favorable development. Uh, so equ equitable access in health, I guess, is, um, is, the, uh, is the key. And what does that mean? That means obviously sufficient quantities. So an accent on production, how to enhance production capacities in an equitable way, well distributed all over the, the world in various regions. There's also a question of, pro of price, which entails enough transparency on how the prices are fixed. What are the costs? Where does R&D um, costs uh, come from? What is the part of public funding of this uh, R&D? And how to indeed um, recognize the true value of the private investment or risk taken in R&D. And there's also a dimension of um, the effective rolling out of these products. It's extremely important to have enough quantities, let's say, of vaccine to distribute and to actually be able to distribute them around. <laughs> but it's also important that once they are in the countries, they are set in, a, they are um, then distributed and provided to the people with effective health outcomes. So I guess uh, that would be the, the notion of global public good, which actually has to be broken down a little bit in order to ensure that uh, 
we do get to concrete results and not only remain on the at the level of principles. Regarding your question on um, Africa and more, more uh, generally Global South, well, that it was indeed the whole aim of the ACTE accelerator. It was an emergency construction. It was important that the equitable access was right from the beginning set as a principle. Um, there was a very strong solidarity push from a certain number of nations, not necessarily all nations contributed to ACT-A, but it was definitely a very strong show of solidarity by Europe in particular. Um, now going forward, it's important to learn lessons from that model, which was built in an emergency, performed as an emergency solution um, satisfactorily to some extent, possibly not the best model going forward in the future now that we have time to build something a little more um, solidly. And, um, and this is exactly what everyone is now uh, concentrating on. There's been a review of ACTE, which is a very useful um, a starting point. And there will be discussions at the G20 about how to um, put together the right mechanisms going forward in order for the response to be more efficient next time run and to put the right act, um, the, the right uh, focus on preparedness which does entail to a large extent giving the right value to the long-term sustainable investments in strengthening health systems which represent the best line of defense against any any pandemic and if I may, one very last word on the regional aspect of this. And uh, I want to, I want to uh, recall the words of a uh, leading French scientist who has had uh, or had had broad global multilateral international experience and was asked to contribute to the reflections at European level and said that he was struck at how relevant the regional level is mm -hmm. in order to uh, face and well, we hope avert, but certainly respond to a pandemic. That certainly applied to the European Union as a coherent model in many ways, but to uh, Hans Kluger's point, would well would would be interesting to to expand to the broader European region. Uh, the reason being that if you're managing borders, if you're that there are it's it makes sense to do it at a regional level. Uh, climates are closer. In Europe, well, obviously we all come, European countries come from different historical, cultural, etc. backgrounds, but there is a vicinity of systems. All of that makes this European or regional, let's say, level really quite relevant. And we have seen, moving now to Africa, we have seen a the um, uh, level of the African Union and in particular the Africa CDC really rise up to the occasion. And we have seen this regional dimension of the response emerge throughout the crisis. And there are now similar projects to, in some respects to those that we are um, thinking about for the European Union being designed for Africa with the project of an, um, an African regional medicines agency, for instance. And of course, the, the amazing emergence of the CDC as a, as a center for surveillance and for uh, regional co uh, coordination, as well as um, the setting up of the AVAT mechanism mm. as a correspondent to the COVAX uh, mechanism, which within uh, ACTE is the vaccine uh, pillar. So it's very interesting to see the emergence of these uh, regional dimensions. They have a different history. They are obviously um, not similar. But um, I think those two ensembles, um, the European Union and the African Union, are designed to keep a very uh, strong and interesting dialogue going together. And that's certainly going to be something that the, the French presidency of the European yeah. Union will build upon. I think this is a very, very, very important uh, observation you're making here, the regional because one fits, you know, in the global perspective, one one size fits all doesn't uh, doesn't uh, work. Before I try to bring in our audience again, and this is my call to raise your hands in a moment, um, I would like to uh, ask uh, Ruxandra very very 
uh, not briefly, <laughs> excuse me, but but you are the industry here, and and I think um, the industry voice I want to say, and and your company even was was very very crucial and important in this vaccine initiative, you know. So I think it showed, and I want to say that also in a positive way, you know, it showed how important a public uh, a private partnerships are in a, in a situation of crisis. What what is the lessons you learned, you know, as a company, but also as industry in general and you know how would you like to 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 carry that on and what is your what do you envision what are the next big steps are uh, thank you for this question and uh, I, i'm going to take it about 15 years back uh, because we were able to respond so fast to this pandemic because of the research and development investments that have been done both by public and private uh, entities for many, many years. Uh, the tools that uh, we have used in these 10, 15 vaccines that arrived to the patients right away, the research started 25 years ago uh, and we've just learned and we were able to use that uh, as a basis of our rapid response. So one of the big lessons is that we don't need to lose the focus. We have to continue both as public and private investors uh, to, 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 to really look at research that is targeting pandemic, epidemic, and endemic pathogens, but also other, uh, other diseases that are in fact affecting um, large populations uh, in low, and in, uh, low income settings, which are by and large, neglected in, in, in R&D. And that takes me to uh, our own j, j example, but also to the leadership uh, of the European Union, who for years invested in science, in technology, in human capital uh, that addresses these issues. Um, uh, our COVID vaccine would have never seen light if it wasn't a project that has been co-developed by the European Union and uh, Johnson & Johnson in the context of the Innovative Medicine Initiative. In 2014, we have both responded to the Ebola crisis. And within a year of that collaboration, uh, we had 10 clinical trials, including a phase three clinical trial in Sierra Leone. As of today, we have vaccinated more than 250,000 uh, individuals at risk in the Ebola belt with that vaccine. Uh, in particular, in Rwanda, at the border of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but also throughout each and every one of the occurrences uh, of an Ebola outbreak since 2014. That project actually was not only to develop a vaccine platform, but it had a technological component. It was uh, the EboVac and EboDAC. The EboDAC actually developed the technology that we are actively using a, a vaccine monitoring platform that including biometric identification. You know that in many of these countries, you don't have a proper identification, you don't have an ID. So uh, we've actually used iris scanning integrated uh, with uh, monitoring of vaccination uh, and reporting every day uh, and let me very, be very clear, the data belonged to the countries. We didn't see it. We just provided the tool that would enable them to follow the vaccinations linked with mobile technologies that allowed the individuals to come back to their vaccination. And even during COVID uh, actually allowed a compliance rate with multiple dose vaccination of 94%. Okay, uh, which is completely unheard of with a pandemic volcano eruption in a war zone. So all those, and obviously the mobile technology was also used to send proper messages, correct information, and combat some of the rumors that were so prevalent in these, uh, these areas. So I think that we need to think out of the box uh, and in all these 
uh, element, say you took the lead, what are the next programs of, of research and innovation that would help the world actually be better prepared, including in sub-Saharan Africa, including in resource limited settings? And I would end by actually citing a, a study that has been published a, a few years ago by CEPI uh, that was looking at the cost of the investments uh, in a vaccine development for uh, pathogens with pandemic and epidemic potential. It pointed to up to 2.3 billion per vaccine, okay? Look at what ha the world has accomplished. It is only through public-private partnerships and through collaboration that we can succeed. Thank you, uh, Roxandra. I saw one raised hand. Uh, may you may I ask you to use the microphone so that the world can hear you, not only the hall here. Hello, I would like, uh, my name is Alexandra Horolakis. I'm from the European Medical Students Association. I would like to go back a few steps to the One Health approach, which we've been discussing here as well. Um, as students, we also believe that the One Health approach should not only be intersectional and, and to, well, interprofessional, but also intergenerational. We've been talking about the future, and this future, in our opinion, should include the opinion of the, or the voices of the people who will be shaping that future and who will be working in that future and who will, who will have to, by definition, so to speak, deal with the consequences. Now, the WHO and especially uh, Hans will, uh, well, we already collaborated in the YPYP forum and the Young Peoples and Young Professionals forum, which was a great success. And you will probably recognize the next sentence because I repeated that about a hundred times, which is we need non-tokenistic approaches to youth involvement. Additionally to that, however, we also need non-abusive approaches. What we have seen during the pandemic is that a lot of medical students were involved in France, for one, that has always been the case in the healthcare sector that was always very organized. There was a clear definition what students can do and what they can't do, and they were protected. However, due to a lack of medical professionals, students were involved in other countries as well, which did not always go smoothly, which led to abusive situations, threats, not no personal protective equipment being available or not being handed out to the students. And looking at the future and looking at pandemic preparedness, we just want to underline that we are more than, more than happy to be involved. We want to be involved. That is why we chose this profession. However, we would like to underline the fact that this involvement, in our opinion, needs to be organized with recommendations for the member states that if involvement is planned, that this involvement is in a safe manner, that students don't fall into the cracks and are missed in terms of insurance claims, et cetera. A lot of students got COVID. It was unsure whether they were insured by the hospital or not because they weren't officially employed. It's not really a question more food for thought, but maybe also the question as to, apart from the WHO, who has already started this involvement of the youth, how that could maybe also be done in the European, on the European level within the European Union a little bit more. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. That's a very important issue you are raising here. Maybe I can direct it to, to, uh, to our minister here in, 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 in Ljubljana, because I do know that you are a very practical man. I don't want to direct it to Hans, because you already got a good note here. <laughs> but uh, minister, uh, what, on the practical terms, you know, how can we how can we structure this? You know, this is a, it's an operational and organizational question. How can we structure that, not only in a, in a member state like yours, but on the, also on the European level? Uh, thank you for this question. If I understand it right, uh, there's a question about uh, students and how to... Involving students in, in, in not only in process. pandemic crisis, but in, in, in public health in general, yes. Yes, uh, in Slovenia, st students uh, uh, had and they will also have an important role in health promotion. There are uh, in, many, in many projects, uh, especially in the countryside, uh, when they uh, help us uh, on the field of health promotion. Uh, that's uh, when we are talking uh, out of pandemic, but when we are talking about pandemic, we have to mention that they were very important uh, um, uh, when we uh, try to find uh, as much as possible uh, citizens for, vac for vaccination. Uh, then also they were included in all processes, uh, especially uh, last autumn in all processes, 
with uh, f when in which we manage uh, people with COVID, and they were with their professors and uh, other staff from uh, faculties, and they were involved in all these processes, and they were very important uh, that we. Uh, uh, pass the e epidemic last last year like we did, uh, and uh, I'm I'm sure that all we uh, learned a lot uh, from this, and uh, we will uh, continue with this process to uh, including uh, students in all uh, processes in the healthcare system uh, through uh, in the time of their uh, educational process. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to add something on that? Yes, I think it's a, a great, great question, which actually brings us to the question of the, the very important question of the human resource, which makes up about 80% of our health systems and which maybe we want to talk about later. But uh, to your point, and as the minister from Slovenia said, also in France, students spontaneously volunteered to come and help when the crisis started in, in France, as, as was the case in other countries, as well as retired medical professions, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a very important part of the response and it will be very important to, to actually le learn lessons and see how this can be streamlined in, in the future. But I ask for the floor to simply justify to a pilot which was had been started in France before the pandemic on another topic, which is that of uh, uh, education to sexuality and prevention of addictions. And as a pilot, the Ministry of, of, of Health set up this proposal to medical students as part of this uh, curriculum to, well, become trained on those issues as part also of their training and to go to schools and the the idea was that younger uh, people talking to uh, school age teenagers, something there would be more efficient. And it worked extremely well. We're now, um, well, basically taking the feedback from the experimentation, which was going to be scaled up and then COVID came along. But I am sure that a similar type of approaches can be used to, um, well, learn the lessons from the, from the way that students uh, in, in all uh, professions of, uh, of the health uh, sector uh, reacted and how could that could definitely become possibly a, uh, a proposal at um, European level. So great proposal. Thank you. Are there, are you, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Marisa Pay, and I am uh, uh, Deputy Director of the Integrated uh, Research Unit um, in CIRAD, which is a French Institute for Agricultural Development. And I'm also a representative of the Preserved Initiative here, which is the Prevention of Emerging Zoonotic Risk, which has, has been launched by France this year, but it's an international uh, initiative in order to promote prevention um, and, uh, and collaboration uh, uh, for, for emerging risk. So my question, and I would like to, uh, to talk about uh, funding, funding of prevention and funding of one else. So we all agree that one else is a key uh, for prevention, but also uh, for uh, control of uh, current uh, health issues. Uh, it has been shown that very uh, uh, important to, uh, to join forces, even for uh, diseases that are currently uh, being endemic uh, worldwide. Um, the, the issue of uh, funding of prevention uh, requires sustainability. And uh, the problem is that the benefit of prevention are often not seen, that's the prevention paradox. So uh, we've seen a lot of funding emerging from crisis. So we've been working for 15 years on uh, one else aspect uh, linked to the uh, avian influenza risk, pandemic risks and pandemic threats. We've seen the funding going uh, down with years because uh, it was not seen as a, as a risk uh, anymore and that emerging risks were not such a priority. So the question is about how can we ensure sustainability of, uh, prevent of funding in prevention and the other issue that we've been facing over the years for the One Health funding is that uh, as every organization, uh, donors are organized in silos and it's been very difficult to get uh, funding uh, for a One Health approach uh, because we have to talk to different divisions and departments and EU is not the only one. Uh, uh, private uh, foundations are also organized in silos and they just don't know how to uh, really fund uh, such an approach. 
So yes, so my question is, how do we ensure funding and sustainability of prevention through a one-else approach? Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we lost the, the, our Madam Commissioner on this because I think the European Commission has quite a bit of initiatives when it comes to, 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 to uh, and a new generation of funding instruments actually uh, in that regard. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm checking the chat box here to bring in the, our, our global audience, so to say. Uh, and, and there was also the, the, the notion that we shouldn't only concentrate on vaccines, et cetera, and investing in, in pharmaceuticals, but it's also necessary to have a strong investment when it comes to uh, primary health care, you know, a new generation of uh, health workforce. You know, I think this is, you know, I, I also can reflect that from the national point in my own experience in Austria, you know, how important it is to invest in primary health care and then and in a new generation of, of, of workforce. But who wants to pick up this question, you know, to secure the funding instruments also? I think Hans, you have many points in, in the in the in the in the report of the of the of the Monte Commission, so to say, but uh, uh, maybe you can uh, touch on that very briefly, but then I would like to give uh, the direct question to our political representatives here, the minister and, and, and Stephanie. <laughs> but Hans, Thank you, maybe... Dear Clement. So uh, I, I don't think I'm in the, the best position to uh, answer on the funding instruments, but definitely <laughs> something on the point of the prevention. Because I can only agree that this is the, the paradox, right? If as a public health specialist, we do a good job, no one sees it because we're doing the good job. But when there is an outbreak or something happens, so to turn it positive, I mean, this is the moment that many of us has uh, dreamed about, obviously not about the human suffering, but about the fact that both the people and the leaders in countries do speak and prioritize public health now. So actually, I'm sitting here a little bit out of Copenhagen at the retreat, the first physical retreat since I'm two years in my position with my 33 country directors. And the big question that is coming forward is, how do we collectively ensure that when we move out of the acute phase of the pandemic, we keep public health at the top of the political agenda? And I think that's our collective duty. And that's, for example, again, why I established the independent Monty Commission, which involved previous heads of government, previous heads of finance. And that's also what I tell to my people here at the retreat, that, of course, for us, health is the most important. But if we talk to other sectors, we have to think, how can we be part of the solution to solve the headache of the other sectors instead of coming from a more narcissistic point of view? And I think that, to be positive, we became more smart. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. May I ask um, Minister Poklukla also on this? Because, you know, we have in the European Union you know, this, um, this really large uh, financing instrument of the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Uh, did, did the ministers of health, may, may I ask you as a president, <laughs> so presidency, so to say, did the ministers of health uh, push forward that we get lots of funding for for prevention for primary care and and others out of this uh, really huge pot of money which we have now established in the European Union minister do you can you can you deliberate a little bit on this yes uh, thank you Clemens for this question uh, yes uh, that's very important found for uh, Slovenia and all member states. Uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, I have to uh, also mention how is in Slovenia. Uh, in Slovenia, uh, primary uh, healthcare uh, preventive services are financed from uh, health insurance, national health insurance. But uh, there are also uh, uh, society um, organizations that work on health promotion, which are financed from governmental budget. So we have uh, two, two, uh, two parallel ways, two combination, how to uh, be stronger in promotion and health prevention. Uh, otherwise, like you mentioned, uh, the fund for re more resilient healthcare systems uh, 
from the European Union um, is very important for Slovenia and all member states. And uh, I think that uh, we will see, like uh, said, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Stella Kyriakides, uh, we will see these results in the future. And this is investments. These are investments for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That might lead us also to, to at least on my, my agenda here, to the third topic I would like to touch, and that's structures. You know, I think we all need, uh, you know, organizational structures. And maybe, Hans, I can start with you, because I think the, I, what I see here in the last couple of weeks, actually, in, among international leaders, that, uh, that I think it's pretty clear that all global health initiatives and emergency initiatives, et cetera, et cetera, should be anchored under the, under the umbrella of WHO. So I think this, this, this uh, is, is pretty clear, at least if I listen to the, the big leaders among the world. But Hans, you have to be self-critical, not you personally, because I think you personally and the WHO Euro is, is a little different when it comes how we survived in this pandemic crisis. But what do you expect and what can you offer, so to say, to the world when it comes to governance structures and, and new structures of reaction within WHO? Once again, you know, it's not so much a Euro question, but it is a WHO question in general because there's a lot of expectation when it comes to WHO, but sometimes WHO is not in a position to deliver. Thank you, uh, Clemens, and also for highlighting the nuances with, uh, with, with the region, but definitely, well, first and foremost, let me, and I think this is very sincerely, express appreciation to Ambassador Sidhu and to Minister Poklukar for the EU and France, among other the other EU countries, standing strong on multilateralism and a stronger WHO, because I always say it's in difficult times that one knows his friends. And the worst, indeed, Clemens, and you know me, the worst that WHO can do is to be defensive. We have to be self-critical, and this is part of my vision. I call it WHO fit for purpose. We speak a lot about lessons learned of the pandemic, but WHO has to self-reflect on its institutional Resilience, and that's what we have been doing here. So a number of uh, points. And again, I see it because I'm sitting here with my 33 WHO country directors. What is very important, and Ambassador Sidhu alluded to this, is regionalism and inter-regionalism. We have great region directors. As you know, dear Clemens, I invited the region director of Africa, Dr. Moïti Shihiri, to our region committee, also Dr. Ahmed Al-Mandari from the Eastern Mediterranean region, because we work together on the issue in uh, humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. And what we are doing as region director is basically global multilateralism on a daily basis, because we are proxy to the countries, historically, culturally, linguistically. Even if the region directors would be empowered to call for an alert before a pandemic, I think that would be very helpful. And I believe that it is this regionalism in our region which kept our euro narrative alive and relevant. Number two is that we all struggled and we have to be, I think both countries, policymakers and WHO, on making policy in times of uncertainty. We could not wait till we have clinical trials or there was all the evidence. That's why we need to be stronger on the precautionary principle. Primum non nocere. First and foremost, do not harm. And that's why I created the Monti Commission, but also another very important group chaired by Professor Antoine Flaho, director of the Global Health Center at the University of Geneva, with 15 experts meeting monthly to update the narrative how to get out of the acute phase of the pandemic. Finally, you're all acquainted, I'm sure, with the report of the IPPR, the Independent Panel, which told WHO is underpowered. So what we need is either a revision of the international health regulation or more ambitious a treaty, but it has to include consequences if the signatories do not adhere to its terms, including unfettered access for WHO assessment missions and sharing data. Because WHO is only as strong, dear Clemens, as the teeth that you member states are giving to us. And finally, 
The IPPR also told that WHO is seriously underfinanced. Mr. Bjorn Kummel from Germany is chairing the Global Group on Sustainable Financing of WHO, and he was telling the financing model of WHO is rotten, literally his words, that for 35 years, the financing model of WHO didn't change. We are led by member states, but the funding by member states is only 20%. So this is the Achilles heel. I will stop here because I can become very passionate on this issue, Dr. Clements. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Maybe I can direct this question right to Yanis, you know, uh, and I also have it here in the chat book. You know, how radical uh, will the politicians be after this political crisis when it comes to better preparedness and response? And, and sorry, Minister, uh, but you are the presidency. Do you think that the EU member states are willing to raise their financial contribution, their assess contribution when it comes to strengthening WHO? And I think there's for the audience one important number. Only 16%, only 16% of the WHO uh, um, uh, budget out, you know, roughly 3 billion euros uh, dollars uh, is coming from assessed contributions. Other politicians, the member states, the governance, the 27 governments of the European Union are ready to raise their assessed contributions. How radical are you, Minister? <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, the pan pandemic has sh uh, showed us uh, that we need a strong World Health Organization. Last year, during the German presidency of the Council of the EU, we were very clear about supporting the leading and coordinating role of WHO in global health. Um, we all have high expectancies of uh, WHO. Therefore, we also need to ensure that it has sufficient financial support to act upon the commitment made by member states at the go uh, governing bodies. So I think that, that I was clear about uh, your specific question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Stephanie, I have to ask you the, a similar question because uh, the, the, the circle of presidencies has to carry on this, you know. You know, what is your vision when it comes to really strengthening this global global collaborations under the umbrella of the WHO. And one of, one of course, is the financial um, uh, situation of the organization. You touched on, on the instruments, accelerator, et cetera, et cetera, a little bit. But if, when it comes specifically to the WHO and the global role of WHO and the role the European Union can play within WHO to help fulfilling, uh, that uh, help WHO to fulfill its global uh, responsibility. Well, we are a very strong supporter of WHO as France, as uh, Europeans. There's a very strong understanding, for instance, with our German partners. And we heard Minister Jens Spahn uh, at the opening of the WHS reaffirming this. So uh, why is this? Well, there are many reasons, but the two main ones are, A, that WHO is inclusive and it is an all state organization. There needs to be an opening to the private sector, to civil society organizations, to health associations in general. This is definitely a, a, um, um, a necessity, but it's very important that this organization at political level is inclusive. And the other reason is that WHO embodies a vision of public health as a common public good, uh, which indeed, um, is embodied in its uh, regulations um, capacity. It's, uh, and WHO must remain the beacon of science, which actually gives it the legitimacy to um, uh, in, uh, put forward this uh, vision of public health through its recommendations and through its mandate on um, pandemic surveillance, which does need to be reinforced. So uh, I guess that's the, well, trying to, to be synthetic about the, the why. Now about the how, um, yes, we can't keep asking WHO to do more as, well, this is a, a line from the, the German Minister of Health uh, without uh, having a really good and serious look at how it is financed. And we have to be serious about financing not only enough in volume, but also through the appropriate channels. And uh, 
this is uh, this is something which, uh, well, Dr. Tedros said himself also at the opening a couple of days ago here at the WHS that, in, with uh, as you said, only a fraction of um, the uh, financing being um, non earmarked. Well, uh, this is less margins of maneuver left for the organisation. This also would give contributors, member states, also more legitimacy to ask for accountability and to uh, indeed, uh, in return, have maybe more demands on exactly the results and the way the, um, the missions are implemented. And all of that is virtuous. So definitely an interesting um, orientation, uh, certainly for Europeans who are very aligned on this and have been since the, the beginning of all this global health architecture reform discussion to, um, to, to propose things at uh, international level. So, Stephanie, so if, if I do understand you correctly, France as a member of G7, G20, you are strongly supporting all these global health initiatives under the anchor of WHO and not the other bodies and not to contribute to more fragmentation in this world. Well, no, I think what's important is that the right instruments are put in place for the right missions and that we think about this without there is uh, there is a sense of emergency linked to the consciousness that we all have and this has been reminded by uh, in, including uh, well Hans Kluger just now that there is indeed a political window of opportunity for the right decisions to be made which might close in a little in, in which might close soon. So there is reason for this sense of emergency, but we mustn't um, reproduce the, um, well, let's say the, the, uh, the, the, the quick setting up of things as just as we could in the middle of the tempest, the reaction and the building the boat in the middle of the tempest that we did when the pandemic struck. So we really have to be both clever and thoughtful and at the same time, do this as quickly as possible before the window indeed, uh, well, maybe not closes up, but becomes a little more difficult to navigate. And so in terms of umbrella with, well, WHO at the center or as an umbrella, well, uh, definitely the pivot doesn't mean to say that we don't need to readjust or maybe invent new mechanisms mm -hmm. to address new needs. But this has, be done, it has to be done in a thoughtful, thoughtful way and inventing a new something isn't going to be the magical solution to what we have lived through in the yeah. past months. Very wise word. Thank you very much. So I have to uh, come to the closing of this session. And uh, Ruxandra, I didn't, don't want to leave you out. So maybe in your final statement also, you, you are representing here the, the private sector, so to say, in a, in a strong panel of uh, public sector uh, figures. Uh, what is your expectation when it comes to uh, collaboration and partnership and and uh, for the next uh, few uh, years you know because I don't want us to be here next year and then we said okay we forgot all about our uh, our lessons we we are, we are we are learning here Alexandra maybe your closing thoughts on this also <laughs> yes thank you as you know uh, Johnson and Johnson is a strong uh, proponent of public private partnerships and uh, of working together to address uh, long term uh, issues and I'll give a completely different example and this is in the area of antimicrobial resistance uh, you know very well that while covid unfortunately resulted in uh, five almost 5 million unnecessary deaths uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance kills about 8 million people a year. Uh, and uh, our company has uh, always, always had a long-standing commitment to address these, uh, these, these issues collectively. Yeah. So, for instance, we've partnered with other 20 pharmaceutical companies and contributed to this one billion uh, US dollars fund in, in the AMR investment fund to bring two to five new antibiotics uh, to the people who need them the most in the next 10 years. That's the type of investment I think that we all need to take stock of and think. The long-term investment where it is about public-private partnership, where it is about collaboration, and where each of the stakeholders in these collaborations are bringing their own strengths and knowledge and skills 
to advance a common agenda. Thank you, Alexander. So the last two minutes we have, Minister, your Christmas wish when it comes to Europe and the European Union and the voice in the global health. What is in one sentence your Christmas wish? Uh, my uh, wish sentence would be uh, European Union as a strong post-pandemic leader in global health and a strategic partner in building resilient health systems worldwide. Thank you. That's a very good one. Hans, yours. United action for better health from local to global. <laughs> very, very broad wish. Thank you very much, Hans. <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> Well, I hope that in the year that comes, Europe reminds itself that it is applying largely, although perfectively, universal health coverage and empowers itself to, well, propose um, a way in that direction at the global level. Thank you. My Christmas wish is that next year at the same time we don't sit here and start over all again, but that we have accomplished something uh, in governance structures and financing structures of our global health initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, this is to conclude this, um, this uh, session on Europeans as a Euro, uh, Euro, EU roles in the global health sector. Uh, I would like to draw your attention that there is an initiative going on on the European Health Union. You can find all this uh, material on the web pages and websites. And uh, I would like to thank our panelists for participating. I think we had a good and lively discussion here and it showed the broad topics we have to cover when it comes to Europe, Europe and the global health. And I wish you a very successful uh, continuation of this conference and all who are leave, leaving this and going home, safe travels home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.